Yeah, so welcome from, from Trondheim. It's 9.30 in the evening here and a few degrees below freezing, a little bit of snow outside, a few centimeters, but a little bit more in the mountains around. And so this is the, the um, outside circumstances. And yeah, my talk is uh, about global reference frames distinguishing blade motions relative to the mantle and true polar wonder. And I've seen you have already learned a lot about uh, global plate motions uh, and is in particular absolute reference frames for plate motion. So, so my focus will then be more, more on my own work, which is mantle dynamics, so to understand uh, uh, how the moving hotspot reference frame uh, comes about, so more the, the mantle dynamic background for this, although that some of this also has already been mentioned in the previous talks, as I saw. So um, can you go on to the next slide? Okay, um, yeah, so we'll, my talk will basically be divided in two parts. Uh, one is uh, ba uh, back to the part back to about 130 million years ago where you still have hotspot tracks and where you have the absolute reference frame based on hotspot tracks. And yeah, as I said, you, you have heard a lot about this. And, but then in the second part, I hope there's something which, is, uh, which hasn't been talked about so much is about when you go further back in time before you have still uh, the um, before you still have hotspot tracks, how you can still devise an absolute reference frame based on paleomagnetism, and um, this is this other second paper which was included in my reading list, which is essentially about this. And then I, I will also talk up about a few applications of this um, reference frames. What's the use of these uh, essentially linking uh, plate motions with processes in the deeper mantle? Uh, you need a, a common reference frame for them. So one of the applications will be the relation of large igneous provinces with low, large low shear velocity provinces in the lowermost mantle. Then another one, uh, how dynamic topography relates to plates. And then finally, how we can try to include uh, locations of subduction comparison with seismic tomography to even further improve that uh, absolute reference frame. So let's go on to the next slide. Uh, first part, as I said, is about absolute plate motions from hotspot tracks. Of course, the most famous hotspot track is the Hawaiian hotspot track. And you have learned about many different methods, how to use the geometry and the ages along the tracks to compute absolute plate motion. And my uh, contribution to this uh, business is that I uh, consider the modeled hotspot motion and then try to improve um, the uh, absolute plate motion models by considering the motion of uh, hotspots in the mantle. Next slide. Okay, so this uh, should now be uh, a movie. I hope it's running. Um, what the movie is supposed to show, um, I can't see it running here, but you should see it running, that um, this is essentially a mantle dynamic model. A man yeah, okay, it works. It's a, you can, I can see here now a plume coming up in the middle. What essentially shows is in the top is a cross section along the center line, and in the, the other three is in the upper mantle, in the mid mantle, and in the lower mantle, horizontal sections. And what I want to point out is with this, uh, with this very simple model, which is just a viscous uh, flow model heated from below, um, those uh, plumes come out of this. So, so whenever you have a, a mantle heated from below, uh, you will have a plumes as a mode of um, mantle convection. And if you have like a temperature dependent viscosity, then those plumes will become more narrowly focused as other models show. In my model is just a simple, no temperature dependent, just a radially varying viscosity. But I wanted to point out that a plume sort of naturally come out of those kind of convection models, as long as you have this basal heating. Um, so they're not put in in any way into the model, but they came naturally out. So I find this fairly convincing. So that's why I don't really follow by as a group of people who are so strongly opposed against this idea of mantle plumes. So I think it's a, it's some uh, fairly uh, uh, meth, uh, 
it's a, a model that can explain many things and um, it also it shows another thing is that those plumes don't tend to move very much so they tend to be stable for for long times and essentially once you have established this convection pattern it tends to be uh, stable and it also shows that they're globally they tend to be around 12 plumes so this is my best guess uh, about how many plumes there are and I think that he agrees with what other people recently think so it's probably not just one or zero but probably not 50 or 100 either so something 10 to 12 plumes seems like a of course, the result might change a bit if you have a, a more sophisticated model, but this is sort of a, what I would expect. Um, now, I don't know which ones are the 12 plumes, but I'm pretty sure that Hawaii is one of them. Okay, so let's go on to the next slide. Now, um, now I introduced this uh, rather simplified model of plumes, which I used then to compute the motion of hotspots. Now, essentially, I first I have a large-scale mantle flow with a cold material going down, hot material going up, and in this large-scale mantle flow, I then insert a plume conduit which is initially vertical and which then gets tilted and distorted in the large-scale flow. And each element of the conduit uh, has a total velocity which is a composite of the large-scale flow velocity and the buoyant rising velocity. And then uh, starting from this initially vertical conduit, and I let this just get tilted and distorted in the large scale flow field. And the motion of the, uh, where this uh, conduit intersects the surface, that's the hotspot, and the motion of this point at the surface is then the, uh, would then be the hotspot motion. And uh, the mantle viscosity structure I use is, is based on an optimization of fitting the geoid with, a, with also a, a heat flow. And, and other constraints. So I want to point out that those large-scale mantle flow models are not totally unconstrained, so there is some observations which we use uh, to, uh, to fit, um, and that's why we think, uh, anyway, there, there, are, there are some observations how, which you can use to test those large-scale mantle flow models, so they're not entirely unconstrained. So let's go on to the next slide. This shows uh, one of those mantle flow models, um, typical mantle flow model. Essentially, you can see in the upper slide, if you focus on the Pacific, on the region around Hawaii, you have in the upper mantle, you have an upward, you have a northward flow in that region. Essentially, outward flow from a large scale upwelling under the central Pacific. Whereas in the lower mantle, seen in the lower slide, you have a flow in the upper, in the opposite direction, a flow towards that large scale upwelling. So you sort of, um, if you then look sideways, you can we go on to the next slide now? Sideways are showing a cross section at the longitude of Hawaii um, from north on the left to equatorial locations on the south. You get as you get for all times from 120 million years to present, you get a, a southward, uh, we get a downward motion in the north, then a flow towards the equator close to the command boundary upward motion in the south and then a return flow in the other direction. Now I start with the present day uh, density heterogeneity is inferred from seismic tomography. I then use these flow fields to add vector density heterogeneity backward in time and also change the plate motions with time. And then in the second step, as I said, I insert the initially vertical conduit at an initial time here, 170 million years, and then this ton conduit gets distorted and the hotspot moves. And in the case of Hawaii, it first the upper part of the conduit gets moved towards the north, whereas the lower part gets moved towards the south. But then uh, this uh, plume conduit gets swept towards this large-scale upwelling, and when it gets uh, when it's inside this large-scale upwelling, and gets moved upward, then uh, this when this tilted conduit get moved up, upward, uh, then um, there tends to follow a southward motion. So there tends to be a, a prediction of my models uh, that the Hawaii hotspot has moved uh, southward. So let's go on to the next slide. And uh, this slide shows then uh, as a so-called 
sort of colored warm, the um, the motion, the computed motion of the surface hotspot is starting um, 120 million years ago, about 40 degrees north, and then gradually moving southward to its present position. And it also shows, you have seen this in the talk by uh, John Tarduno, that um, this is more or less, uh, at least uh, qualitatively, in agreement uh, with uh, paleo latitudes, this model southward motion. Uh, the, the bottom uh, right picture you have also seen in previous talks shows again uh, the predicted uh, hotspot track for Hawaii through the global plate circuit and the um, observed hotspot track. And this misfit between the two hotspot tracks uh, cannot be entirely uh, explained by just a uh, modeled hotspot motion. And, th and this go then goes on to the next slide. Um, so this um, uh, this track, um, this predicted track through the global plate circuit uses a, a plate circuit uh, connecting Africa through East Antarctica, Mary Birdland, and um, and towards the Pacific, which is the model one, uh, which is shown in the top left. But uh, there is an, a second uh, model, which we developed in this. Uh, paper uh, together with Rupert Southern and, and Rick O'Connell, which was the first one on your reading list, uh, is a second uh, plate circuit which we proposed going through Australia and New Zealand. And then uh, with this second plate circuit, um, then let's go on to the next slide. Okay, now this shows, shows again uh, that if you have uh, this, uh, the difference between those two plate circuits is a rather small uh, dip additional deformation which is required in Antarctica. But because the rotation pole uh, corresponding to this uh, deformation sits in Antarctica, so this rather small deformation there can lead to rather large differences in the prediction at the location of Hawaii. So, um, so with, a, with a rather small deformation, which is probably within uncertainties, you can get a, a a different uh, predicted Hawaiian hotspot track. And then let's go on to the next slide. Okay. Yeah. So uh, this then shows uh, if you use, for one thing, uh, this southward motion of the Hawaiian hotspot, and for the other thing, you use uh, this different plate circuit, then uh, the southward motion gives the, the predicted hotspot track further north. And this different plate circuit moves it uh, towards uh, the um, towards the east. So, combination of using the different plate circuit and having the southward motion of Hawaii then allows us to fit at least up to about 65 million years to get a fit to hotspot tracks uh, globally, which is uh, shown here for only for two hotspots, but for others it works as well for the Tristan hotspot and for the. Hawaiian hotspot. And this works back to about 65 million years. The misfit increases further back in time, but uh, we speculate that there might be some additional uncertainty in the plate circuit de deformation within New Zealand, um, which then can explain this remaining midfit, misfit. So um, this is the main point of this uh, global reference frame with um, moving hotspots that you cannot only fit uh, hotspot tracks on, on either hemisphere, the African and the or the Pacific, but for the first time within one reference frame, you can fit hotspot tracks um, on both hemispheres, at least back to 65 million years. Okay, uh, let's go on to the next slide. Now this just shows um, that um, besides uh, those uh, hotspot tracks and paleo magnitudes, there are other ways uh, still to test uh, those models of uh, of plumes in large-scale mantle flow, and these are related to seismic tomography. For one thing, uh, we can compare the prediction in the upper mantle, like shown here, two papers which we have been participating in, one for the Yellowstone plume and one for um, a plume in, in Hainan in southern China. And then also uh, in another paper uh, together with Lapo Boski and Thorsten Becker, we did a global sort of statistical 
comparison of where the uh, predicted plume conduit surface were, were seismic uh, fast, now where slow seismic shear wave velocities are observed. And the reason for doing this kind of statistical comparison, not uh, comparing one predicted plume conduit with uh, an observed conduit is that, uh, as you probably know, uh, seismic tomography does not yet convincingly show a plume conduit in the lower mantle. There are some models which claim to show it, but others uh, say they don't, and which is, I guess, also the reason for the skepticism against plumes is that uh, plumes in the lower mantle uh, cannot uh, yet be uh, uh, convincingly observed. But with this statistical approach, we have at least shown uh, that with the tilted plume conduits, we can get a better agreement um, with a fast, with slow seismic shear wave velocities than with uh, vertical conduits. So let's go on to the next slide. Now, um, this is again supposed to be a movie now. Um, I try to get it running. So, um, yeah, what, what it shows is, um, what it's supposed to show is um, that several cross sections through the Earth uh, and uh, Starting from present-day density heterogeneities inferred from seismic tomography, I, I, con I compute this large-scale mantle flow. Oops, now, no, okay, now this one I still want, yeah. I, I compute this large-scale mantle flow um, and the density heterogeneities backward in time, and then based on this mantle flow, I compute dynamic topography on top. Essentially, when you have a downward flow, it drags the surface down and then you have negative dynamic topography. When you have an upward flow, hot material going up, it also pushes the surface up. And in order to relate uh, this um, dynamic topography to observations, um, you have to combine it with motions of ab absolute motions of plates in the same uh, mantle reference frames. And that's uh, what I did. Um, so let's go on to the next slide. Um, this slide is supposed to show uh, the motion of the uh, North American plate in an uh, um, absolute reference frame and then uh, the development of dynamic topography on the North American plate. And one application where we have used this in a paper with, uh, together with a uh, Dietmar Müller as main author is that um, we use this uh, uh, change in dynamic topography on the east coast of North America uh, to correct uh, sea level curves which are based on observations. So if you have a, a sea level observation at a certain plate that moves with the plate over dynamic topography, you will have to correct uh, it um, for uplift and subsidence of that, uh, that site in order to get the correct sea level curve, and that's something uh, which we used it for in this paper. Another application um, showing here on the next slide for Australia is um, it's not running, huh? Okay, now it's coming. Yeah, for Australia. It's also moving uh, away from an upwelling towards a subduction and, and so uh, you get this what is called anomalous subsidence. So the plate is moving over towards the upwelling so there is more subsidence than would be if there was just normal sedimentation. If you have only normal sedimentation you also get it sink, sinking down. Um, but because plates tend to move away from upwellings uh, and towards downwellings during the dispersion of plates which is going on right now. Right now we are in a, in a sort of in a, in a period where the plates uh, tend to disperse and then maybe later they will come again together for a new supercontinent. But then now they tend to disperse and move towards downwelling so they tend to move down and this creates additional accommodation space. And so that's another application to predict those uh, anomalous subsidence of those absolute plate motion models. So let's go on to the next slide. Now, um, 
Now we come uh, now to the second part of my talk, which is um, what you hopefully haven't heard so much about yet, which is this, about the second paper in the reading list, is when you go further back in time, how can you still get an absolute reference frame when you don't have uh, hotspot tracks anymore? Now what we still have is uh, reconstructions based on, on paleomagnetism, but those uh, might also be affected by true polar wonder, which is rotations of the entire Earth and not of continents over the mantle. And, and also this uh, paleomagnetism, there's uh, longitudes is initially unconstrained. So in order uh, to figure that out, how to use that paleomagnetic reference frame to get still absolute motions over the mantle, what we do is first we look at uh, what the paleomagnetic reference frame does for a time when we still do have hotspot tracks. And this is shown here for this time interval from 100 to 110 million years. And in the paleomagnetic reference frame, so in a reference frame where the pole is fixed to the North Pole, you get in this time interval, 100 to 110 million years, you get a, a coherent rotation of all the major continents. But uh, this same coherent rotation is not observed in the hotspot reference frame. And so that's why we think, uh, because it's not in the hotspot reference frame, but in the paleomagnetic reference frame, that such a coherent rotation of all the plates is indicative of an event of true polar wonder. And this is why we therefore then go back further in time and look for, those, for more of those coherent rotations especially rotations of the continents around a point close to the center ma of mass, which is also close uh, to, um, to the geoid height over Africa and close to a large low shear velocity province in the lowermost mantle. And let's go on to the next slide. Now, um, for true polar wonder, I first briefly will uh, introduce what is true polar wonder actually. I will then uh, show how, why we want to distinguish between plate motions and true polar wonder, which is, I guess, I already said. I will then, in order to understand why uh, this is uh, physically reasonable to assume that those coherent rotations are true polar wonder, I will explain a little bit about the physics of true polar wonder. And I will then show how to distinguish between between plate motions and true polar wonder, first with hotspot tracks, which is essentially the, the figure I just showed you, and then next without hotspot tracks. Okay, now let's go on to the next slide. What is true polar wonder? It's essentially the motion of the Earth as a whole relative to its spin axis. Next slide. Okay, what is not true polar wonder is uh, when you have um, just uh, the continents moving on, on top, but uh, the coherently moving on top, but the mantle underneath not moving. And then go on to the next slide. But what is true polar wonder is when they, they both, the deeper mantle and the continents at the surface, they move uh, coherently. And next slide again. It shows uh, when you just look at the surface, all the continents moving coherently, it may either be a true polar wonder or it may not be true polar wonder. And in order to distinguish between that, on to the next slide. Yeah, and the reason why we want to distinguish between true polar wonder and plate motions, uh, go on to the next slide is again precisely because we, we are interested in the relation of the plates relative to the deep mantle. So it makes a difference if you want to study things like um, dynamic topography, whether a plate sits ab above an upwelling or above a downwelling. So that's why this is relevant to distinguish. Let's go on to the next slide. Physics of true polar wonder. And again, the next slide. Um, yeah, so um, top figure shows again the geoid and there are some uh, features in the geoid where those red arrows go to, which are essentially um, related, uh, known related to subduction. And if you subtract uh, 
those features which are related to subduction. The residual geoid bears quite some similarity um, with uh, the shear wave um, velocity heterogeneities in the lowermost mantle. So you have one a large low shear wave velocity province under Africa, you have another one under the Pacific, and those we believe are um, stable for a long time, which a little bit later I will come back to this, why we think those are stable for a long time. So if they are stable for a long time, and then they are also associated with a long-term stable geoid highs. And if you have those geoid highs, the Earth's rotation axis always tends to orient itself to keep masses as far away as possible from the rotation axis because it minimizes rotational energy. So that's those two geoid highs tend to stay on the equator. So you really expect true polar wonder to keep those uh, geoid highs along the equator. So you expect true polar wonder along this blue circle shown in the lower, um, in the lower um, figure. And this blue circle um, leaves uh, basically the center of mass of the continent roughly at the equator. It also leaves uh, this uh, large low shear velocity province and the related geoid high at the equator. And now we compare, going on to the next slide, and once again, the next one, we compare this uh, a true polar wonder, which we expect to be possible based on this physical model with a observed true polar wonder in the hotspot reference frame. <coughs> and we see um, that this observed true polar wonder, we only have one episode between 110 and 100 million years, which corresponds to this coherent rotation seen in the paleomagnetic reference frame. As this episode of true polar wonder follows more or less this blue circle. I mean, I think you have also seen in the previous talks how those uh, true polar wonder curves, um, in, when you still have hotspot tracks are constructed, is essentially you get an apparent polar wonder path. And for uh, this apparent polar wonder path collected to one plate reference frame, typically the African plate, and then you use the absolute plate motion of Africa in the hotspot reference frame to convert this again to a, a true polar wonder path. So that's also essentially what we have done here, which is uh, based on the data in this very long uh, paper with, with Tron Torswick. So um, back to 120 million years when you still have hotspot track, you can uh, devise this uh, true polar wonder curve. And yeah, as, a, as you see, uh, you get um, an one event of true polar wonder 110 to 100 million years, which corresponds to a coherent rotation of all the plates in the paleomagnetic reference frame, and which, as we expect from our physical model, follows uh, the line more or less which we expect true polar wonder to occur at. So let's go on to the next slide. Yeah, this is again the figure I have just shown um, um, this um, motion of um, this uh, true polar wonder event corresponding to this coherent rotation of all the plates leaving the center of mass of the plates approximately at the equator and also um, the um, large low shear velocity province and the geoid high and this rotation axis uh, rotation of all the plates is also very similar to what um, already Pavoni in 1969 uh, uh, proposes a geotectonic center. So even uh, when plate tectonics, during a time when plate tectonics became established and also the first ideas of plume race, so he had this uh, idea of that there is a large scale degree two pattern in, in the te tectonics of all the continents. And this has later been then confirmed that this degree two pattern is also seen in the, um, well, essentially in, in, in the shear wave velocities of the lower mantle. And yeah, and, and so this is another further confirmation is that this true polar wonder tends to also leave those, as expected, leave those um, geotectonic centers at the equator. Next slide. 
Okay, yeah. now without hotspot tracks, as I said, we look, we look now for those um, similar coherent rotation of all the plates. Now you should be at 135 million years and then go on to 145 and 195 million years. And you can um, sort of, um, <coughs> just a moment, I, I get it on my other computer. Okay, um, if you go back and forth between those three, you, you can kind of see like in a, um, um, getting those three pictures right next to each other back and forth, um, you see this coherent rotation of all the plates. Again, which is what we interpret as true polar wonder. And in the next figure, again shown with um, blue dots, um, you know, at 145 to 135 million years slide. I guess it's fine. But you see again those blue dots is the position at, at 135. 145 million years, and then the, the arrows, the position, uh, the, the motion indicating, or those lines indicating the motion between 145 and 135 million years. And again, essentially indicating a, a coherent um, rotation of all the continents. And then go on to the next one, showing 195 to 145 million years. So again, showing a coherent rotation of all the continents. And then 220, the next slide. 220 million years and 250 million years. Next slide. Okay, you should have the... Um, Slide now, 250 to 220 million years, again showing a coherent rotation of all the continents. Now you have, of course, have the continents all assembled already in one supercontinent, so, so the coherent rotation is even better visible now because you have very little relative motions. Go on to the next slide. Okay, and now in order to do this, um, a um, bit more quantitative is what essentially what we do is for each time step we compute for all continents combined their center of mass, then their inertia tensor, um, then their angular momentum corresponding to the rotation. And then with the inertia tensor of the continents and the angular momentum simply as a mathematical identity, we uh, compute uh, the mean rotation of the continents. And we then split up this mean rotation in comp components at the equator <coughs> at a center of mass longitude at the equator 90 degrees away, which is a uh, rotation around this, uh, around this uh, red arrow and which corresponds to a coherent northward motion of all the continents and at the, and at the pole. And this motion along the pole is something which you cannot find obviously with paleomagnetism. So you get the other two. And we think that this uh, rotation at the equator near their center of mass longitude is essentially, if you have those rotations, those are due to a uh, true polar wonder, whereas this uh, coherent northward motion of all the continents is probably not uh, due to true polar wonder because it wouldn't leave uh, this, this uh, geoid highs and related um, large low shear velocity provinces at the equator. And then we time integrate uh, those um, rotations and go on to the next slide. Okay, and once we have time integrated, you get, um, you get this black curve, black coherent curve showing um, the um, time integrated rotations of the continents around the equatorial point close to their center of mass. And this precisely shows again the same, um, more quantitative, the same things which we have seen, those coherent rotations, one from 250 to 225 million years, a, a coherent counterclockwise rotation of all the continents. Then they stay again, then they rotate clockwise, rotate further clockwise, then in the end, between 110 and 100 million years, rotate counterclockwise again. And if you look at the uh, 
those dashed and dotted lines, those are for uh, hotspot reference frames, which are go back in the African reference frame, now those dashed lines, okay, in the African hemisphere, they go back 230 million years, and you don't have this episode of true polar wonder. Uh, we don't have this coherent rotation from 110 to 100 million years, which is, as I said, which is the reason why we think that the earlier coherent rotations are also um, related to true polar wonder. Now the dashed line is, the, the, the gray line is this rotation around this axis 90 degrees away and which we, uh, which we think correspond to northward motion of all the continents over the mantle but not related to true polar wonder. If we um, remove those presumed episodes of true polar wonder as we expect the remaining uh, coherent rotation of the continents because we re removed what we think is true due to true polar wonder, there's not much uh, rotation obviously remaining and also because uh, the rotation poles we used uh, not exactly at the center of the continent, we get a more smooth coherent northward motion which is shown through those dotted gray line. And maximum speeds of true polar wonder, we get about one degree per million years, which agrees with dynamic estimates, which is based on convection speed and rate at which the equatorial bulge can adjust. So um, we think that um, 10 degrees per 10 million years, or about one degree per million years, is about the upper speed of uh, what, uh, how fast true polar wonder can occur. And this is roughly in agreement with uh, what we see here. Next slide. Okay, so this is about um, yeah, true polar wonder and um, related to um, so how how to relate uh, paleomagnetism, how to use paleomagnetism to um, the mantle reference frame. Another uncertainty from paleomagnetism, besides of this. <coughs> possibility of true polar wonder is uh, that you don't know, initially don't know about the east-west motion. And so we do kind of a similar thing. This is from a paper which um, just came out in EPSL in December now, which is Tron which is again first author. And again, uh, for the time when we still have hotspot tracks, which goes back to, which is shown here, back to 100 million years, we can compare for different continents how much they have moved east-west, and we see that, like, um, um, cumulatively, we see that like South North America and India and also Australia, they have moved uh, quite a lot. So they presumably that they're, they're not suitable for a reference uh, continent, but. Uh, Eurasia and Africa, they have moved rather little. And because Africa is sort of central in the plate a circuit, which is um, connected to other plates, so it's, it's more suitable than Eurasia. So we pick Africa as a reference frame and we, as a reference plate, and we presume that it's the, our best guess that further back in time, Africa and further back in time, then uh, the uh, Gondwana and then Pangea, where it came out of, um, have not moved much east-westward. This is also, again, a dynamically reasonable because Africa has been surrounded by spreading ridges and um, subduction zones, yes, but mainly towards the north. So we would really, if any motion of Africa and earlier Gondwana land, you would rather expect a northward motion rather than east-west motion. So, so our best guess, uh, what we propose is to use Africa as a reference plate with a no east-west, presuming no east-west motion for back in time when we don't have hotspot tracks anymore. So now we have resolved, we think we have resolved this east-west issue and also the true polar wonder issue back to about 300 million years. And so now we can use some further applications for this uh, reference frame relating, again, plate motions to mantle dynamics further back in time. Now, next slide.
This should show again those large low shear wave velocity provinces um, in the lower mantle. Just a moment, I advance my other computer. Um, yeah, and when you uh, reconstruct a large uh, igneous provinces to the places where they originally erupted from using those plate motions in the absolute reference frame corrected for true polar wonder and uh, with Africa using as the reference plate for east-west motion. You can reconstruct back to 300 million years where those uh, large igneous provinces have erupted. And the pattern which we find by um, doing this reconstruction is that those large, uh, low sh sh large igneous provinces all tend to have formed along the edges, so not ab above the centers, but along the edges of those uh, large low shear wave velocity province, typically close to the minus 1% contour if you use the S-mean model for the shear wave velocity province. Um, and they also found that there are steep gradients along this contour. And so our idea is that um, because uh, they have formed uh, back to 300 million years along this, uh, along this margin. So these uh, large low shear wave velocity provinces must have been stable for about 300 million years at least. And, and in order to get it stable, keep it there in the lowermost mantle, we think that they must be uh, chemically distinct. So they must be something different from the rest of the mantle. And plumes rising along the edges essentially, there is, doesn't exist any, any dynamic model. I have shown you my um, dynamic model earlier where plumes essentially arise anywhere in the lower mantle and they don't have any um, chemically distinct provinces. But we think the reason why they anchor to the edges of those um, chemically distinct provinces is because those are hotter than the rest of the mantle and the edges are steep and so you get a, 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 a inclined thermal boundary layer. So you get a hot, lot of hot material sort of rise, like rising along a wall, along a warm wall. Uh, you develop this upward uh, flow. And so this is why plumes are uh, predestined to rise along those edges of those large low shear wave velocity province. But as I said, uh, there's no dynamic model yet uh, which actually gives this outcome. And, and so that's a challenge for the future to, uh, to show that this is also dynamically consistent and not just a, a conceptual model. So I think you have seen it now several times running through. And I hope you're convinced of that pattern. So let's go on to the next slide. <coughs> Another um, application of this reference frame is that you can uh, reconstruct subduction zones and then like you saw subduction zones also to drive dynamic um, models of the mantle and then compare the outcome of those dynamic models with seismic tomography again and then try to get a good agreement um, between um, dynamic to um, no, between seismic tomography and the predicted mantle density heterogeneities inferred from subduction history. And that's shown in the next slide. Okay, now the next slide just shows, again, a subduction zone that at zero million years. So uh, the um, lines along the subduction zone show the convergence rate. And for present day, you, you still have some fairly good, uh, well, you know essentially how the plates have moved. You know which plates have converged in the plate boundary and you know um, at what relative speed, pretty much. But then let's go on to the next slide. If you go um, to 70 million years, um, problems uh, begin to start. Uh, because for one thing, uh, you, you don't have a, con a, a complete record of the plate boundaries anymore. So you, you only some uh, record of plate boundaries in the center of the Pacific plate is left. But uh, you don't know exactly at what speed the plates have moved. So that's what you need an absolute reference frame for again to get the relative motion of the plates in the Pacific relative to motion of plates um, in the rest of the world. 
and it also um, it, uh, the different uh, convergence rates uh, for different uh, depending on which plate gets abducted were and if we go on to the next slide 840 million years of course um, it gets a lot worse so um, uh, it's uh, quite some guessing of which plates get abducted where and at what what speed but um, with all those uncertainties we can then try to run models and then try to fiddle around and, and see whether we can get a good agreement somehow between a model prediction and observed present day uh, um, seismic shear wave velocities assuming those seismic shear wave velocities anomalies are related to density anomalies okay next slide uh, this is essentially um, yeah it shows um, uh, when you put uh, the subduction subducted slabs in a different location at different times according to those subduction history models you develop a uh, density heterogeneities in the mantle and I should add that this model is now it's it's only um, it's not basally heated so that's why I don't have plumes here now so as I said in order to get plumes you need a basal heating but those plumes wouldn't come out where, I, where the actual plumes are anyway so I just uh, put the slabs in here so I got a slab model and let's go on to the next slide I can then, uh, for the present day, um, the predicted present day um, density heterogeneity from subduction history shown here on the left can be compared with um, seismic tomography models. And as you see, in some regions, there's some pretty good agreement. In others, you don't get any agreement. For example, well, obviously, uh, cross section one which is a cross-section through the Iceland plume. This is only seen in the tomography model, but uh, obviously, as I said, you don't, I don't get any plumes in this model, so there's no co correspondence um, in, the, um, in the predicted density model. So um, anyway, so the idea is that uh, in the future, we can, imp we can uh, try to use trying to uh, um, improve this fit between a predicted density anomalies and density anomalies inferred from seismic tomography to um, further improve this global reference frames. But it's something which we are working on in the future. So let's go on to the next slides, which is essentially my conclusions now. Um, first, uh, I was talking about reference frames based on moving hotspots, where the hotspot motion is inferred from global mantle flow models. And the main uh, um, main thing coming out is that with these uh, moving hotspots, we can now fit hotspot tracks globally back to 65 million years. Also, but we also need an, a, a different plate circuit from the one that is traditionally used to, to get this fit globally. And this hotspot motion also helps to explain paleo latitudes. Then, um, even in the absence, for the second part of the talk, I showed uh, that even in the absence of uh, hotspot tracks, plate motion and true polar wonder can be distinguished. And we have identified several episodes of true polar wonder, which are up to 18 degrees at speeds not exceeding one degree per million years. Among applications, I have shown. Um, that uh, we expect Africa approximately to be fixed in, oh no, no, not yet applications. Okay, we have, furthermore, we expect Africa to be approximately fixed in longitude. Among applications, I have shown that uh, large igneous province eruption sites are reconstructed to the margins of large low shear velocity provinces in the lowermost mantle. And this again bears on the uh, dynamics of plumes is, is essentially also an additional indication that plumes do indeed come from the lower mantle because if those large igneous provinces which are believed to um, to represent plume heads if they were just shallow features and you would never expect this uh, good uh, co uh, correspondence with their reconstructed eruption sites with the 
just with the edges of those features in the lowermost mantle. Second application was that combining plate motions with dynamic topography computation can give a uplift in subsidence at a specific sites. And for example, can this be used to, to bring a dynamic to a, um, yeah, to correct uh, observation-based sea level curves. And as a future outlook, we expect further improvements of the reference frame from using a subduction reference frame. Okay, and this finishes, concludes my talk. Thanks for your attention.